Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. Can I have your podcast by the end of this song? Can I have you naked by the end of this podcast? I don't feel you don't feel committed to that. Have you ever been to a Justin Timberlake show? I have not. I have. Here's where this comes to a head. Not a big fan. What's your problem with Justin? We'll get into it. I'm All sure right, we like, have a lot to talk about for the next 45 okay. minutes. For for a period of time where I was like, oh, maybe I want to audition for SNL. I should have impressions. Uh-huh. You know, when I was So like, you tried a Justin? I thought I had a pretty good one at the time. Do it again? Well, that was me singing. Let me do talking. All right, fine. Hey, I'm Justin Timberlake. Yeah, that's, that's, then you nailed it. Right? That's, yeah, sure. That's exactly what he's like. Hey, Lauren, I'm in town this weekend. If you want me to come on the show. But do him in the social network. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? No. Is there something? He is a, pr- a good actor. He, he does voices. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. He, here's the Justin Timberlake pattern. He is a very good actor mm, whenever when he is working with good a great director. Yeah. Which he smartly often does. Yes. Yeah. It, that's a weird thing. I think I generally overall am not a fan of his as an actor. And he has given maybe four performances that I cannot deny in any way in movies I love. He's also, as I pointed out, I think online at one point, he was in two of maybe the best five movies of the decade. Uh, Lou and Davis and Social Network? Yeah. Right, because Love Guru was the decade And three before. if you count Popstar. Right, right. But see... His cameo on Popstar is a perfect example about... Where you're kind of like, okay. This is where I'm like, Justin... But four if you count In Time. In Time also falls into the category of like, I saw In Time. Of course I saw In Time. I saw it in theaters. Opening weekend. They were out of time. What do we think of Friends with Benefits? Now I'm just looking at Justin. Here's my take on Friends with Benefits. Neil Kunis rules. Mm. Justin's a problem. Someone needs to rein him in. And he sings a song, maybe? Does he sing a song in he that sings one? Closing time. Oh, closing yeah. Closing time. What about. I'm in Justin Timberlake. Um, Southland Tales, very compelling scene where he lip syncs to the killers. I think that's kind of a good performance. Yeah. What about um, Wonder Wheel? For God, he was in that one. Wow. Well, you know, that's my favorite director, and I want to talk about it for a very <laughs> sure. long time. Sure. What about uh, The Love Guru? He's been in a lot I made of that movies. Joke. I made that joke. He's been in so many movies. Yes, he has. You made that joke what? That, that The Love Guru exists? No, I made it and everyone laughed and they gave me an Obi and you moved on. You said he's been in two of the five best movies oh, in the last decade and I went right because Love Guru was the oh, decade I'm sorry, previous. I talked over you. Well, it was very funny and I got the awards I deserved. What about? I'm a big, big special boy. Um, I'm going down here. Shrek the Third. Yeah, yeah, he's in Shrek the Third. I Which know. Martin, March Madness be damned. We Apparently he's in Yogi about. Bear? Was of he Bam Bam? He's Boo Boo. I mean Boo Boo. <laughs> Put some respect on that name, David. This is, Bam Bam's the Flintstones. <laughs> correct. This is another example of me going like, does Justin Timber like need to be Boo Boo? <laughs> like, come on. Who do you want to be Boo Boo? I don't Griffin know. Griffin Newman? Well, I mean, look, not a bad take. Maybe it's time for a reboot. Dark and gritty Yogi. Um, no, but Rachel, I, do you know about the Yogi Bear poster? No. No, come here. Come here. Rachel, you must see this. Uh, Yogi Bear has the worst poster <laughs> tagline combination of all time. Oh, you told me about this. <laughs> of course, the tagline is, great things come in bears, which barely tracks as a joke. But to make it worse, the poster is Yogi standing directly behind <laughs> Boo Boo, towering over him, almost as if your mind could wander to the idea. Let's just, let's just leave it there. Um, but yeah, it's just great. It's just great. He's having sex with boo boo <laughs> behind. It's just funny because then they pivoted to like, life's a picnic. And then they were right. like, oh right, it's Yogi Bear. We, there's plenty of other things we can do. Here's what I find most offensive about that poster tagline combination. You're implying that Yogi is a great thing? <laughs> sure, he's all right, isn't he? Because he inarguably is coming in a bear. That is, there's no question. Quiet. Quiet. What about Runner Runner? I mean, another example of just like, Justin, what are runner, we doing runner. here? Affleck's in that. Yeah. And Gemma Archerton. Who I feel like never got. She, she kind of got, she could, made a couple bad, you know, choices. And yeah, things. and like almost got, like, she was... Almost the Numi Rapace role in Prometheus. Mm. She was almost the Scarlett Johansson role in Under the Skin. Wow. That'd be interesting. She was the choice 
Okay. And they told Jonathan Glazer that he get couldn't a get the actor. finance. Sure, right. And I think she was in talks for Prometheus, and then Girl with the Dragon Tattoo came out, and Numi Pace became the new hot thing, mm. and they, like, slotted her in there. And then the ones she did take were, like, Runner Runner. Uh, Prince of Persia. Uh, Hansel Clash and Gretel. Right, you're like, she was in the big movies. <laughs> Uh, it has two titles. The Boat That Rocked is the uh, British title, I yes. believe, and Pirate Radio is the American title. I don't know why they thought The Boat That Rocked would baffle I mean, they're, American audiences. They're both such gripping titles. <laughs> it was kind of like they were damned if you do, damned if you don't, because either title is going to have audiences tearing down the doors to get into that theater. <laughs> <laughs> so Timberlake... Justin Timberlake, we're talking about his acting career. But why are we talking about but that? But that's not what's really on the docket today. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about both because this is a podcast about, mic check, mic check, filmographies. Yes, yes. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion products they want. Sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce baby. And this has been a mini series on the films of the great Jonathan Demme. And we are closing it out. This miniseries titled Stop Making Podcasts yep. with what is his final feature-length directing credit. Sad. He did a couple TV episodes after this. Right. But he passed. Did he really? I mean, he only died like a year after this movie came out. I know. I think yeah. he has two or three TV episodes that at least air after no, I this. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, he was pretty prolific at the end of his career, uh, despite the fact that uh, there was a little bit of a slowdown on uh, narrative films. Sure, but he, but he did, was always very prolific. He did a lot of uh, documentaries in his last final years, a lot of TV, and he even did an off-Broadway show. Sure. His first time directing theater. He was a guy who was constantly experimenting until the very end, and it was very sad uh, that we've lost him. Yes. Um, his birthday was pretty recent. There was sort of a— February 22nd. There was like a swell of uh, Twitter again of what would have been his 76th, I believe, birthday. Uh, that sounds right. 76th or 77th, yeah. Um, but he really was a one of a kind special guy and I'm very happy we've talked about him and we'll get emotional at the end of this episode when we wrap up our thoughts, but we're using mm. Justin Timberlake plus plus symbol, the Tennessee kids as an excuse to, to get our final thoughts out there and to also sort of acknowledge some of the other work he did because in the, this mini series we've done, we only covered two of his documentary films proper. Yeah. Stop making sense. Main feed. So many Cambodia Patreon. Right. In total, he made 12 or 15 feature length documentaries. Well, you know, I'll watch him sometime. I watch. I'm busy. I watch I'm Carolyn Parker and mm. Storefront Hitchcock. Mm-hmm. Um, Some I, of them are very hard to find. Yes. Yeah, like Cousin, Cousin Bobby, Bobby is like which is one of the ones find. that's supposed to be incredible. The one that I'm really fascinated to watch. Yeah. Yes. And I couldn't even find it through Cough Cough Illegal Channels. Uh, I tried. Um, and I ambitiously thought at the beginning of this miniseries, because it's been so long, wow. that I would somehow find we the time to watch all of the docs. All sorts of things. Even if they were off uh, subject, but I didn't. I watched I'm Carolyn Parker, which is about a woman displaced in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which is a wonderful film. And I watched Storefront Hitchcock, which is another amazing concert film. 150 bucks for a VHS at Cousin Bobby. This is the thing. It's like that's the only way to access it. Mm-hmm. And then another 20 bucks with a VHS player. Yeah, right, exactly. Excuse me, Rachel. I have a VHS player because I own too many things. Yeah, Jesus, I do not have a VHS because my player. my apartment is a nightmare. Yeah, of great. course I have a VHS player. Um, I own too many pieces of garbage, like a VHS player. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't need a VHS player. I know, you know, like... You know, because the other problem is that that encourages you to have VHSs, which is another space taker-upper. Sure. I have not bought one in a while. I will say 10 years ago... There was a set of under 10 films that were amongst my favorites that had never been released on DVD. But that, any right, but that's sort of. I think there is now zero now. films yeah. I have on VHS they've, they've that got I don't. Them all off. Yeah, yeah, I think pretty much. Uh, especially just with the ones you can just rent on Apple yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 100%. Uh, the ones you don't rent on Amazon because they're a bad company. That's done everything wrong. Um, but yes, Justin Timberlake and the Tennessee Kid. His final film, and feels very much like Justin Timberlake being like, I love Stop Making Sense. Yeah. I'm doing this tour. Right. Would you like to film it? I would love, now that I am Justin Timberlake and I can kind of do whatever I want, to have Jonathan Demme make my concert film. Which he'd never really done a concert film before. I'm sure he's had filmed Timberlake? concerts. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. No. I mean, he hadn't. I mean, this is only 
the twenty twenties are like his third and fourth albums. Like it's not like yeah. he. There must be an end sync movie. That's what I'm saying. There must be right. some VHS. I mean, a reason to keep your VCR. Mm-hmm. There must be some like no strings. Well, attached not. I mean, I'm not video. talking about on the line. The romantic comedy starring Lance Bass and Joey Fatone from right. 2001. Right, which many view as canon within the NSYNC universe. <laughs> uh, which he is not. But they're uh, NSYNC bigger than live. Uh, right. There you go. But I imagine that's a pretty straightforward kind of just like, here's a concert you can watch yeah. at home. Yeah, yeah. Get a chance to see NSYNC perform on your television screen in their own concert film. That's the the plot description of and sync bigger than live now what we were sort of talking about at the beginning of this episode it feels like the 2010s were justin timberlake trying to fight against being a musician by and large the 2010s right you think so fight against being a musician i think he just wanted to become a movie star exactly I don't think it, it, that counted as fighting against okay. his it, musical. It's not fight side. against. No. I think he very much wanted to background his music career so that he could really focus on the movie star thing because I think he wanted to be someone who was seen equally as both. He, right? I'd, I'd love to chart exactly how it all worked for him, but definitely the combo of SNL, yes, him becoming such a a popular, whatever, which has uh, always drop in guy irked me. Because I think he does he's a like, fine job yeah, he's on like SNL. Pretty funny. And then he you shows know, up and like, people act like he's well, Steve Martin. You know, people talk about athlete funny, right? Where yes. it's like, you know, athletes, it's like, those guys are so funny. And it's right. like, no, they're they're like, okay. You right. know, and they, they can but handle But you're like, themselves. LeBron is incredibly athlete funny. LeBron would be at the absolute highest, right? right? And then, but then, yeah, right. You know, like when SNL's hosted by like JJ Watt, and you're like, yeah, this guy's like, you know, he's okay. Right, he's, like, he's charming you, enough. You get right. a good try award. Right. Yeah. Uh, a and, for and Timberlake has a little bit of that energy. Sure. Despite the fact that he is like a stage kid, child performer, like he's been you performing know, his entire his life. His entire life. And that is crazy. His entire life. I was, when I was watching this last night with Fulky, yeah. like we were, I was just like, right, he's literally only been a musician. Mm hmm. Like acting was a new job for him. Well, that was like that. Maybe he was just like, I'd like another job. Except he's starting point was the Mickey Mouse Club where he sure, was that's doing true, both. True. That's acting. right? I guess. He was doing both. I mean, he was doing little skits yeah. and he was doing songs and dances. But even before then, he was like, look, he was raised by musicians, yeah. you know, and he was like a little kid singing like gospel music in church sure. and singing country music on Star Search and all right. that stuff like that's his entire life. Yes. Right. But but yes. Uh he he was doing acting stuff and he was uh you know being in a band like Insync involves a lot of acting. You know it's not like a normal band with normal concerts. There's intense choreography and you're doing music videos that have dialogue scenes in them. You know and they're doing so many like appearances on other things. But yeah, it's like post Future Sex Love Sounds mm-hmm. his sort of his big second solo album. What's the first one called again? Um, oh, Jesus Christ. Justified. Right, obviously. of course. Of Great course, album. of course, of course. Yeah. Um, Where everyone went like, huh, Justin Solo, who knew he was kind of, had the potential to be like an usher? Well, just because the the, the legacy of the boy band right. guy going solo Never is, was. right, right. So he he kind of, you know, he knew what to do. He worked with Timbaland. He worked with the Nip. Like he knew who to work with. Right. He... Right, like he 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 was always like very smart about like how to evolve his career. He he comes out of the boys' own thing. He makes singles that people actually like. Like and, uh, yes, becomes and a solo act that's actually like musically impressive. He kind of takes the lane of I'm gonna do blue eyed soul, sure, but with kind of R and B. Yeah, and then Future Sex Love Sounds is him being like I'm gonna be like Prince, you right. know, or whatever, and like that's bold, and and people mostly went for it. Yes, uh, that album's good. Yeah, yes, yes. I like that album. I do. Congratulations. I thank you. That means the world to me. <laughs> um, yeah, but yes, I think the other part of it is the thing that he sort of most successfully transitioned to is uh, he he went from being teen heartthrob to adult sexy. And the fact that he did that largely through making albums that are mostly overtly sexual. And shaving his head. Yes. Which was just Big move. a huge decision. The old hair was so goofy. I, I would just... Like, you know, I was in the in sync age, right? Yeah. I was more of a Backstreet Boys kid. Oh, of course. Right. So, in a Jets and Sharks way, I was like, fucking in sync. There are a couple songs I couldn't deny, but I was like, not a fan. Mm-hmm. But I would go over to girls' apartments, humble, humble brag, brag, for play dates. Humble brag. After school, supervised by parents. Humble brag. 
And they'd have the Justin posters on their wall. And I'd be like, this fucking guy, look at his dumb hair. Like, I could never get over the, like, bleached ringlets. Yeah. It's very specific. And then he shaved his head and, like, put on a suit jacket. And I was like, God damn, damn it. This guy's this handsome. This guy's like a fucking vest on now. Oh, this guy looks fuck. great. It looks like it's snack anyway, time. Post that, yes. he kind of, you're right. He's sort of like, you know what? You know, going on a bit of a hiatus. He he had done, in the, in the, in the year after, he does a lot of collaborations. And he's like... I'm going to do some acting. And Future Sex Love Sounds is 2007. Yeah. And 2008 is uh, Shrek the uh, uh, Love Guru. I'm sorry. I believe that's nine. Let me look it up. It might be eight. I can't remember. I think Love Guru is eight and Shrek the Third is seven. And it was this thing where like he's doing these two Mike Myers movies and then they were doing a lot of like talk shows together. And then Mike Myers was doing this like promo tour of like Justin Timberlake's a real actor Justin Timberlake's a real actor he's great he's gonna be a real actor and both of those movies kind of don't do anything for him he is very annoying in Shrek the Third do you remember this which is the worst of the Shrek films a movie that does not exist with Jeff Bridges a, it's like a, a road trip movie father son the open road road trip dramedy starring hey Mara yeah like what is this movie I don't know so then it feels like he like backs off again and is like gotta re-strategize the movie career thing I don't think that's true because then he does social network i think well, he I just gonna, stuck stuck with it i was gonna say i think social network is him re-strategizing to the goal isn't to be in the biggest movies the goal is i gotta get in the right movies and i shouldn't worry about being a star i should just work with good directors i will play the third lead in this film rather than he, being the everyone guy everyone likes him so i think he's one of those yes. guys who's just like he's professional he shows up yeah he's very enthusiastic he'll take direction like he you know i don't think he's a very egoy. No. Actor. No. Which is why he has such a good reputation and why, like, the Finchers of the world will well, work with him. there's and- the story about when Fincher hired him and he went, look, I know you're a big star and you're used to doing, like, sure. you know, music and stuff. You're not used to acting, so I'm not going to hold you the same standard as the other actors and make you do 100 takes. Right, with the Fincher thing. It makes you do 100 takes. And then Justin Timberlake was like, are you kidding me? I was in a boy band. I'm used to doing everything 500 times. Right, right, right. You have no idea how hard we had to work out the choreography for our live shows. I'm a machine. I can do this ad infinium. And Fincher was like, this is my fucking guy. Not that he ever worked with him again. Yeah, exactly. I was, well, he only made one more movie. But it was another no, thing, t- too. T- it's another thing where then Fincher goes to people like, I'm very He's impressed with guy. Justin right. Timberlake doing the press. He's like, this guy's a real actor. And that's the one where people start to take him a little I think seriously. He's, I think he's... Totally good in, as you say, movies that are made by, you know, good movies that are made by good filmmakers. Right. I will also say that, like, I've seen Bad Teacher. I forgot he was in it. Who's he in that? He plays the nerdy guy. Great. I've seen, like, I never saw, you know. I'm, He's like I've the seen second Frank lead in that movie. I mean, she ends up with, or she's trying to get Siegel him to leave his wife. Siegel is the coach. Right. right. She yeah, ends up she's with. after Timberlake, yes. but Siegel's the guy who's sort of just like chilling. Yeah. And you're like, well, they're, she's going to end up with Siegel, even though right. Siegel's like four times the size of Cameron Diaz. But he's ostensibly <laughs> the second lead of that and film. And then Siegel and Cameron Diaz did another movie together. So Do you weird. think they're like pals? I guess. And then Siegel and Cameron Diaz both kind of retired from being in movies. Siegel was just on a uh, Simmons' podcast, and he was he is a fascinating person. That is, he's not pretentious at all. He's just yes. like, I was an idiot. I thought being on How I Met Your Mother was bad. Yeah. Like, I would complain about it at the time, being like, oh, I could be doing... And I'm like, that was a lovely show. All the people were nice. I was making all so much money. Like, what's my fucking problem? Like, And he has been very open about the fact that he had very serious drinking problems. And I think sex tape was the end of the road for him, where he was like, what am I doing being in big, stupid movies? And backed away and has only appeared in a handful of indies since 2012? Uh, Yeah. Right? We're not here to talk about Jason. We're not here to talk about We're talking about... Justin Timberlake, but all of this movie star career stuff is important because then you get like things like Runner Runner where he's like, I can do my own like serious adult thriller and everyone's like, hard pass, don't need it, right? Friends with Benefits, which ends up sort of being uh, Bridesmaid 2, No Strings Attached. Yeah, the only thing I would say that we're not counting is that earlier when he's a movie, when he's a pop star Mm -hmm. run of like Edison, Alpha Dog, Southland Tales, Black Snake Moon, when he is... Yeah, fine in all those movies. He's pretty fine, fine good, in all those movies. Playing supporting roles, so right. he actually always has been pretty good about like you know, I, I'm pretty egoless. Like right. I don't need to be, you know. But but to be fair, the energy around those performances felt closer to like when Beyonce's in a movie. Sure, where right. it's like whether well, it's or not she's Kimberly. good, it's like isn't it crazy that this international music star is in a movie? Right. From 2007 on, he's like, I want to be seen as equally an actor and a musician, and so 20- and comedian. 
and a comedian, right? Uh, he's so funny because he shows up and he says a joke. Uh, <laughs> What's the funniest thing he ever did on Thank SNL? You. Thank you. I don't even dislike him on SNL. I, I just don't. I can tell you what I think. It, I think he's fine on it. My, I, I resent him only because everyone overrates his I performances. I resent is too strong. I like Justin. I, I resent, I should resent how much credit he gets. gets. And I also think the more credit he's gotten for SNL hosting, the more his SNL hosting and you know pop-up appearances and other comedy things become Wink, wink, look at the audience. Isn't it funny that I'm Justin Timberlake in this? He did kind of stop, though. I feel like he hasn't done a lot of SNL no. in the years. The sort of Fallon thing has faded in general. But his pop star appearance is like the one bit in that movie that irks I don't, me. I don't remember it. It's all like, uh, yeah, people say I could never be a pop star, so I'm here in the kitchen. Like, it's all meta jokes about uh, yeah. I don't have what it takes. He plays his chef or something. And there was a sketch that was like, all the immigrants on on the boat heading to Ellis Island, and everyone's talking about what they dream their ancestors could accomplish in America. And he's saying, "I want my grandson to be a pop star. He'll be in a boy band, and then he'll do this." It's all jokes about he him. He hasn't been on SNL in t- seven years. I give him credit for that. Yeah, he. I think he really did call it quits. I mean, he did the fortieth special. Yeah, but, you know, of course. Who cares? That's. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's that. You know, but, but post Sandberg that. But the 40th special opens with him and Fallon doing a medley of all the SNL songs. Yeah, and the last two times, the last time he appeared was when Fallon hosted, and he was the musical guest. Makes sense. Right. Right. Those are his two guys. It's Sandberg and Fallon are his two ends. Right. It makes sense he's not coming back if they're not. And I would argue that Fallon, I mean, Fallon, whatever, and Sandberg has a better idea of how to make him funny. Correct. Fallon, in a way... uh, what what am I going to say? It's funny. Well, this is so great. Oh, my God. This guy is right here. He's just Timberlake. Fallon's got a lot of the same problems as Timberlake. Yeah, what are you talking about? So they this br- is, we're having a great time. They maybe bring out the worst in each other. Well, yeah, worst? Sa- There's only good in the world. Sandberg brings out the best <laughs> in Timberlake, usually. Sure. He frames it very well. Um, he, he makes him a fool, and, yes. as he loves to make himself a fool, and that's fun. I have my answer for you. Okay, fine. Here's what I think the funniest thing Justin Timberlake's ever done on SNL is. Sure. A very good talk show. Yeah, that's that's funny. his best comedic performance. Yeah, right, right. But that's funny. Yeah, he's very good. There. But then it got a little boring. Sure, but that's I mean they did it eighteen I mean, times. They did it too many times. But he's anyway. always consistently very good in that. But when this is rolling around, yeah, twenty sixteen, yeah, he releases the twenty twenty experience albums, uh-huh. which I would say are bloated and mixed, very very sort of mediocre. They've got some bangers, but they've got a lot of chaff. Yeah. Here's a very important thing that I want to point out because yeah. this is my whole thesis about him sort of oh, background his music career. Yeah. He signed a three-record deal for the 2010s. Yeah, and he really had to like... And 2016 came around, and they were like, you're zero albums no, in no, six No, 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 no. He released those in 2013 and 2014. Oh, albums. okay. I'm yeah. sorry. But I'm you're sorry. right that the second one, it's it's like, he's like, this is my fourth studio album. And you're like, this is like a remix album, totally. basically. Right. Right. So it, there was that stretching, and then he slips in. Like, I know it's not. It's like a B-Sides album. Right. Almost. right. But he was like, no, this is a real album. It's a right. real album. Contractually, it's a real album. <laughs> and then, uh, what's it called? Man of the Woods? Yeah. Yeah. Is very much him, like, gun I've, to the back of his head. I never even listened to that. I, mean, I saw the music video. It's wild that. Where he looks like Donald Trump Jr. Was- <laughs> on the tree stump. And I saw the name of it, and I said, I never need to engage with this. No one engaged with it. What were you going to say? It's wild that— Just like that, a guy who was arguably, like, the biggest pop star yes. of my teenage years— Yeah. —like, released an album, and people weren't even mad. They are just like, no, that's all right. We're not going to— Because the, the, the headline was, look, it's a contractual thing. He's got to get something out. He made this album in, like, three months. The story was that they, like, came to him, and they were like, you need to start working now. And he made that whole album— very quickly. We once ate at his restaurant. It's actually pretty good. It's not bad. We ate there after seeing Jack Reacher Never Go Back. See, that I could not remember. I remember it was after seeing a movie. I have really good memory only when it's in relation to times so- and places Southern I saw movies. Hospitality, I believe yeah. it's called. I yeah. think it might be gone. I can't remember. Is it still there? I think it's a little chain. I think it exists in multiple places. I believe it's still there in Hell's Kitchen. It's gone. Really? Too bad. There used to be one on the Upper East Side. Is that gone? Looks like they're all gone. Well, oh, apparently Justin has set the record straight. I know this is about. All right, whatever. It doesn't matter. That holding hands with that lady is that what it's about? He was holding hands with a lady. He was spotted holding hands with a lady in Nolens, and the problem is that lady was not Jessica Biel. But who was it? A lady who was in a movie that he's starring in. That's like he's doing like a modern Oliver Twist movie where he's playing the Artful Dodger. 
Jesus Christ. It's like a... Alicia Wainwright? Is she a Wainwright? I don't think so, but he was holding that hand. Oh, Jesus, the sun needs my consent now. Come on, let me find a less offensive website. He was. <laughs> Let's try page six. You don't it's give pretty, him. Do not fun. give him your consent. Uh, he was holding that hand. She's younger than him. They're not holding hands. She has her hand on his knee. Uh, oh, wait a second. Maybe there's a second picture. Oh, they you found zoomed it. in. You found it. Oh, no. Yep. Sorry. They zoomed him. Um, I drank way too much that night, and I regret my behavior. Lots wow. of judgment. Jeez. Yeah. Justin. Yeah. This is another thing I don't like about Justin Timberlake. He's got a kid, you know. They they had a son. Forky was asking me about, um, like, because she's watching this with me, and she's like, "See, like, what is eighteen months of this? Like, yeah, do you see your family? Does anyone else like?" You know, and I'm showing her like the dates and she's like, it's like every two days. Like, how does this work? And then I look up and her, his son is born three months after this show. Which is the last one. You know, they, they got pregnant in the middle of this tour. So I guess she's hanging out. Maybe she's in and out. Right. Clearly he had some off time. (laughs) It's a busy work. What don't you like about him? Here's another thing I don't like about him. Three times is a pattern. Okay. He has at least three times, if not more gotten in hot water and kind of thrown the woman involved under the yeah, bus. Yeah, well, he totally threw Janet Jackson under the bus. Yes. That's and the one I remember. I What's would argue other? he threw Britney under the bus. I guess so. That was right. Like, it, it, that's it, such a past era of yes. tabloids. Yeah. But, but I, yeah, yeah, I he think he manipulated a very sexist media at the time. Oh, definitely. When he was trying to make Britney, himself Britney serious. got screwed over. And push himself out of that. 100%. That he always was cashing in on, I'm yeah. the victim. He has a little She's bit of that lame, Teflon thing. Yeah. And... He kind of does here. Yeah. And this show, I find this movie to be kind of excellent. Yeah. I think it's very well directed, unsurprisingly. Yes. Uh, and I think that he's a very polished performer who is, you know, mostly charming or whatever. But there is that sort of polish thing. I mean, look, if you compare this I to Stop Making polish, Sense, it's right. a terrible comparison. It's horrible. But you shouldn't do that. No, you shouldn't. That's a ridiculous comparison. Right? But the problem is, this podcast forces us to compare the two of them. <laughs> because, this is the gilded cage but we I mean, made but for that, Not only is Stop Making Sense just a totally different kind of show, different yes. kind of performer, but also, like, that's the best concert movie ever made. Right. And But, but you hire the it's guy true. who he made did. the best one. It's but I like, would hire him. Of course. Who would you hire? Jonathan Demme. Exactly. I'd, I'd pull out the Necronomicon. I'd yeah. figure it out. Right. The, the point is, I'm not saying he made the wrong choice by hiring Jonathan Demme. And I'm not saying it was an act of hubris to try to topple Stop Making Sense. But also them being by the same guy forces us to look at the two of them, right? Mm-hmm. And forces you to compare his stage show to Talking Head stage show, which is not a comparison you should make. But if we just get into personal preference, I'm not a huge fan of polish. That's just my taste. Me, I don't like polish. What do you mean? You don't like polish? I don't love Should the I taste keep of doing polish. My Fallon? Yeah, do your Fallon. Oh and my I'll God, do my justice. That's crazy. I, I went to this show. I, oh, Jimmy, that's great. That's great. That's so funny, Jimmy. <laughs> um, oh, man, Jimmy, that's funny. <laughs> um, I think this is interesting to think about the evolution of these kinds of shows when sure. like, the Talking Heads are doing that show. In the early 80s, there's no such thing as a stadium tour, really. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and certainly there is not the production value right, even re- available to you to have like a catwalk that moves up and down the, you know, the arena. And- I, I guess arena rock is starting around that it's time. It's around then. It's like the U2s of the world. But right. even they, I think it's sort of like, I mean, their stadium shows exist, of course. Like, you know, but, but, but like, like it's saying, pretty stripped down. It's like they come out, they play like their Motley loud music. Crew and Kiss are starting to do like yeah, weirder shit. Yeah, I guess there's shit. those guys, right, 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 where it's big, bigger production. Right. And it's like, we're going to put Tommy Lee on a platform. We're going to have explosions. But like, it's still, at the end of the day like a rock band yes and then I, I don't know when the like I guess it's in the 90s that the, the pop tour that will have a lot of you know like a pop star not, which not at a that rock point band. it's like it also needs to sort of function as theater yeah like you have multiple you need costume screens, changes and you need scenes right and, I mean, and it's so much dancing I mean yeah. it must be so exhausting. That's another thing. I just kind of get watching stressed him, out I watching am this impressed. movie. Like, it, I'm impressed. To I sing and dance at the same time. Out. And you see him sweating so much. Yeah. Which is a nice relief. Every time he cuts into a close-up, you see him sweating. And I'm like, cool. He is a human. He's not an automaton. But also, I'm like, why are we making anyone do this? Why is uh, he I mean, making himself he's do He's making this? so much money. This thing fucking makes money hand over fist. I know. He makes so much money. I saw him when I was a teenager. Uh... And it would have been would have been for his first album. Okay, for like, Justified. Yeah, 
And uh, like an O three, O three. Yeah, perhaps. and he was like on this crane yeah. that like you know would like move around, and he would like beatbox. Remember, he was really into yeah. beatboxing. It's not like a fucking kook arm, like yeah. the Harry Potter. Yeah, ride. like he was cherry picking. You know, like sure. he was gonna <laughs> rescue some cats from the raptors. Um, but I just remember at the time being like. Very impressed with just just the the enormity of his effort was sure. so obvious, which is how I also felt when I went to concerts when I was thirteen or fourteen. No, but no, come on, I was going to I went to a lot of rock shows, like as I mostly went to rock shows, and like that's like like the Strokes would come out, yeah, and they'd be like, "We don't do any fucking encores," and then they would like play for half an hour, and they would leave. And Look, you're like, they're so stoned. I think we <laughs> it's went, such a waste of everyone's money. I think we went to a lot of the same concerts in those years. We were well, the same major similar sensibilities. We're talking New York City. Know, we were both no, going to like Roseland nice Ballroom. Getting, no, no, no. I was in London. My friend was going to the Brixton Academy. Going you to would, the Forum. Why would you fly all the way to London to see bands that were playing in New York where you live? I saw JT at Wembley Stadium. Or but I don't Arena. understand. He did he New York Wembley dates. Arena. Why didn't you go to the New York dates? They were. I lived in London. What? Oh my god! Sorry that you were not prepared for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I backed away training. from the mic. Producer in training, <laughs> working the board. I backed away. My point is, I think we were seeing a lot of the same acts because of our taste in music and the time, right? Sure. And I preferred musically groups like The Strokes, but yes, there was no sort of uh, uh, commitment to stagecraft there. No, not at all. And, at that young- and I saw like Oasis or whatever, where like Liam Gallagher was just actively hostile, would sit down yeah. like if he had nothing to do and just kind of stare into space, throw water at people. Like you would see people be like, sure. I paid money. <laughs> like right. this is an uncomfortable experience for me. <laughs> like, I remember sorry. going to a, a Vines concert. Oh God. Where that well, guy he was, was yes. he, he had some issues. He was break, an uh, ill man. Yeah. But uh, he was drinking. God, he went to a Vine. I went to a Vine show. Yeah, we probably went Ooh, to the same one. No, mine was at the Brixton Academy, you maniac. So I went to a Vine show. This is what uh-huh. I'm saying. I think we probably went to a lot of the same sure, sure. Right, we were tours. Sure, we a similar generation. Yes, in the same city. And the Vines guy was drinking Craig, on stage. Craig Gillespie? Craig, uh, no, that's no, the director that's of the director. It was Craig something. What if it turned out that the director of Itania used to be the least? Craig leader? Nichols. Craig Nichols. Yeah. I was a big Vines fan. But he was drinking on stage and then just in the middle of a song, like, turned his head and glared off stage, and then, like, a roadie sheepishly came on stage with the, a different guitar, uh-huh. and then he would just look at him and hold up his arms like a toddler who wanted his mom to take off his shirt, uh-huh. and would make them remove oh, the other guitar. Oh, he wouldn't even d- remove his own guitar. And then put the new one on him. Wow. And he wouldn't say That's anything. some real... Like, I'm 23 and suddenly I'm the boss of everyone energy right. or whatever. So when I would go see a pop concert where there were pyrotechnics yeah, and choreography sure. and, that, and that, that sort of stuff, I would be very impressed. I'd be like, wow, they're doing a lot of work. I went to a Libertine show where, like, the, the Carl and um, Pete fought on stage. They started punching each other. Anyway. Um, you yes. know what I'm saying. When also, when also, like, this is a show where, like, you need to be concerned for your performer's safety. Like, yes. this is, a this is like you say, there's it's it's theater. Like, you But gotta, also, we're both fans of theater. So sure. even though we like like rock music, and to some degree we're buying into the bullshit of these people's behaviors, right? If we're going to these shows, sure. There's also just a, an appreciation that you and I have for that kind of stagecraft, the preparation, the work, the rehearsal that clearly goes into something like this. That having been said, as I've gotten older, it has just become not my tempo. Well, you're not going to go to one. Yeah. I mean, we're old. We're old fogies We're old now. fogies. Oh, God. We're the, do you know? Like, I, I'm now more in the zone where I'm like, Paul McCartney's doing another farewell tour? Maybe I'll go or I whatever. Think, I think the last concert I went to. I don't know why I lifted my mug. Like, it's just an old person, I guess. Good, just was, has no, a mug. It was good physical comedy you were committing right. to the bit. Uh, old people have mugs. Um, it's a new stereotype. Uh, I was going to say, I think the last concert I went to of my own volition outside of Friends of mine. Like, I will go see friends of yeah. mine play, and I will go see them play at the smallest venue yeah, that right. they're playing at, yeah. right? Um, the last one I think I went to, of my own volition, was Yeah Yeah Yeah's, sure. uh, which I went to with Romley when she was still in high school. So this was a handful of years ago. Yeah. And I spent the entire concert trying to justify to her 
why being in the seats rather than in the standing area was the better thing to appreciate the music. <laughs> Let her go to the standing area. You that, stay in the seats. That was the point. Yeah. I realized at that moment, I am I am not of the mindset to be going to these concerts anymore. Sure, right. I am making this experience lame for her. <laughs> she is 17. She should be having fun. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I just, you know, you don't want to stand. Your knees hurt. <laughs> Romley, this is a really good choice I made. Wow. And Fair then, enough. Of course, the people sitting in front of us stood up, and then my point was negated. We were just That's far the away. The minute they the come out, right? Yeah, I know. I'm a moron, and I'm an old man, and it's literally but, I'm the uh, oldest you, person. But you alive. could go to this kind of a show. This is an arena, and you could, you know, you could I'm sorry, sit in a seat. There's one thing I've gone to more recently, which yeah. was Pilot and I went to see Janelle Monae, which was fucking amazing, yeah. and was kind of the halfway point between Where these was, two things. It was at like the Barclays Center. or something? It was at the Hulu Theater, Madison Square Garden. The Hulu Theater. You gotta, you gotta um, stream it at the Hulu Theater, <laughs> that bright green theater. Well, this but show. But that, that show has a lot of video elements. It's a lot of costume yeah, changes. Sure, sure. But also feels Janelle, as much as she yeah, is very a very physical performer, performer. she's a little closer to James Brown than Justin Timberlake, where it's like she's being moved by the thing. And she's constantly moving. Mm-hmm. And it's very physical. But it feels a little more organic. But this show, yes, which we're, we're watching a production at, I believe, the MGM Theater, right? Or whatever it's called. In Vegas. It's his In last Vegas. show MGM of MGM Grand Garden Arena. Well, it's his last great. show on a gigantic, basically two-year tour. Yeah. And Demi doesn't do the same shit he did with Stop Making no. Sense at all. No. The first 10 minutes of it are this kind of lovely, he's introducing you to every member of the band, mm-hmm. and they say where they're from, and they say, like, you know, something about themselves. Yes. And, and um, most of them are from Tennessee. Not most, but a lot. A lot of them. Well, you know, he's Tennessee kid. That's my point. He's a Memphis boy. Right. Um, and throughout, and, and he is truly a Southern gentleman, but I feel like, uh, popular culture tends to smooth people out and make everyone kind of mid-Atlantic. And the last 10 years, he's tried to reclaim a lot more of his Southern hair. Yeah. He owns a stake in the Memphis Grizzlies. It's a basketball team. Well, great. Congratulations. Um, and apparently, uh. Um, he has a partnership with Sousa Liquor. I'm just reading his, uh, his very, they are these celebrities. But I do think, uh, because a show like this tends to be so much a sort of a tribute to the greatness of the one performer at the center spotlight. And it's not what he's doing. It's a very Demi touch to be like, I want to underline how many people it takes to make this show. Yes. And that these people are also on the road with him for a year and a half. And, and that's their lives why... are all in on this and they're a family. Right. right. This tour was actually, it was called the JT 2020 Experience or whatever. And they were like four years early. That's true. Um, but uh, but the movie is called Justin Timberlake and the Tennessee Kids. Classic Demi reframing. Yes. But I mean. Generosity. The show is very, it does spotlight the other performers a lot. And he lets them sort of, you know, they have verses sometimes and they have, you know, little performances and but, stuff like but that. But even in terms of the lighting setup. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look, it's a Justin Timberlake show. That's my yeah, point. Right, right. Right. So unlike Talking Heads, where their show already has that narrative structure that spotlights everyone really individually, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, every performer on stage really gets moments. Demi has to throw in a little bit of narrative refocusing before the concert itself starts. Yeah. By, by letting you spend time with all these people, which is very nice and my favorite part of the movie. Um... I do like that. I like the whole thing, though. I find it very comforting and easy to watch. Like, I, it's, it, it's an, I've seen it before. It's a very easy watch. It's easy to watch. Uh, I was not expecting and was pleasantly surprised by the fact that it is uh, a concert that uh, covers his whole career and isn't just him doing 2020 experience stuff. Yeah. Sure. Doesn't do sync stuff, but uh, he has covers and he has uh, songs from all of his first four albums. Yeah. I like that. Sure. That having been said, it is that weird thing now where it's like after the years of I'm not a boy band guy, I'm like a sexual dude, I'm like in this. I'm He's bringing hardcore. sexy back. He's bringing sexy back. And now it's a very theatrical, very high concept sort of like I'm like a 1920s big band sort mm-hmm. of aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing the full three piece suit, which looks so hot. Tom and, Ford designed. But I was I was going to say it looks physically like very warm. To be wearing on that stage while dancing in that way with those lights on you. Oh my god! I got stressed out looking at him not removing items of clothing. I want. I was like, just do you think he wears unbutton, something underneath, unbutton. like some kind of like sweat wicking maybe clothes? There are those things too. 
uh, which we use on the tick, but not nearly enough. Uh, which they always use for like superhero the things. fans, like the internal fans. Well, that's the crazy like a cooling up. system. They built that into Peter's costume for season two. Uh, but um, no, the thing they do is they they have these things that are like astronaut shirts that are like very tight. There's like a shirt version of it, and there's like a full spandex bodysuit version of it, and there are plastic tubes sewn into it. And someone can there's like a little tube port. And you're back, and someone can unzip you and plug into that, and then they run cool water mm. through the tube. I would like one of those just for day-to-day -day use. David, it is the number one greatest sensation I have ever felt. I love water. I do, too. I want one of those like those toilets that like shoots water at you. I, I want water everywhere in my life. People say this, and they usually don't mean it. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It feels better than sex, this thing. <laughs> and I, I did it. I did. I had someone flick the switch, and I went... This must be why people like doing heroin. This one moment where suddenly this amazing relief comes. Right. But Justin Timberlake could not be doing that because he's on stage the entire time. No. I don't know how he does this. I, I don't think know he how just sweats it out, faint. dude. I think he's just sweaty. And then he like takes a shower. Yeah. Right? What a shower. It must feel must good. Be. Yeah, exactly. That must be a fun shower. Yeah. Maybe he has an ice bath like he's a basketball player. That is something that basketball players do that I also am like, I'm sure they're exhausted. Yeah. I'm sure they are, you know, their muscles are seizing right. up and all that. But like, it seems really nice to walk off the court right. after like two and a half hours of hard exercise. If you're doing something that And intense. get in an ice bath and be like, ah, you know, like yeah. do that. You do a nice noom routine, free plug. You know, Amari Stoudemire, <laughs> get an ice bath. in wine. What? <laughs> Wine and ice? <laughs> I'll show it to you. Uh, I mean, it was he, that was what I was. He was like, "It's great," and it's and everyone else is like, "He's making this like this is not there, there is no medical." He purpose. tried to argue it was actually better for his muscles rather than just being. Yeah, he. I think yeah. Oh wait, a big dog. Everybody. <laughs> You're right. Oh man, he loves bathing in wine. Was it like good wine or was he like bathing in? Like, I hope Francia? it wasn't good wine. <laughs> I, I just want to imagine an intern dumping Franzia into a, a tin bathtub. Yeah. Uh, well, according to a Vinotherapy studio in, yeah. a, in a Tuscadero, uh, the acids in the wine grape strengthen microcirculation. So fuck me for <laughs> even, even daring to. But also he's fucking up with the, the wine with the ice cubes. Uh, that's a fair. I'm not seeing any ice cubes here. Oh, it might, it's might just be, wine? might be just wine. Then he's a purist, and he's a good fan, and he's got a sensitive palate. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. have we ever discussed this insane thing? Five second anecdote that my father every night drinks a coffee mug of red wine with ice cubes in it. My father, who is currently awaiting trial for war crimes <laughs> for that habit, I, his veins are probably awaiting trial for war crimes. They are. Why does he do? Why? Why ice cubes? I don't know. It's the world's dirtiest coffee mug <laughs> that he fills to the brim. Is it always the same one? Is there like a wine mug? He's got like I'd say he's got four really dirty mugs in rotation. They're the same ones he's been using since 1994. Fair enough. He has other mugs. But I feel is like this, the wine is Does he drink wine with dinner as well? Like, or is this like, this is his wine this for the night? This is post-dinner. But he might have had some wine already. I'd say often not unless he's going out. Yeah. In which case he probably wouldn't do it. You know? Yeah. But if he's like having a little dinner by himself, eating at home or whatever, then afterwards he strips down to just his boxer shorts, <laughs> lies down on the couch, puts on a 24-hour news channel, and drinks a mug <laughs> of red wine with ice cubes. Oh boy! Past and future guests, Peter future Newman. Guests. All right. So I don't know the the show, the movie. I mean, look the guy. The guy. It's pretty cool. I like yeah. when he dances around. I said this thing in the Stop Making Sense episode where I'm like, this movie's so undeniable. I can't see the way that anyone would have any complaint against it unless they just didn't like the Talking Heads music, mm -hmm. which I, I also can't even really imagine, sure, right? Sure, And watching this, it's not that I hate Justin Timberlake. I'm conflicted on Cam. There are a lot of things about him that irritate me. There are a lot of things that I think are undeniable about him. But watching this, I was like, I would never of my own volition watch a 90-minute Justin Timberlake concert documentary if not directed by Jonathan Demme. I might watch it. But you're right that the Demme sheen sort of— right. I, I'm, uh, I like. I'm just saying my yeah. personal preference. I just think it's this fascinating thing of like how corporate, and I don't even mean that in 
entirely negatively. Sure. It's more, it's also just kind of how things have gone. Yes. But how corporate this kind of event feels. That's kind of the thing that bums me out. But that, but it's not like Justin Timberlake no, is responsible. I'm but not he's, holding it's, that it's against just how him. The, but it's all, the and world. it's also just the thing of like, if you're going to do something on this kind of a scale, yes. it has to feel like almost like a business operation. Yes. It's unavoidable. And I think Jonathan Demme... And he, he's trying to find these little touches of humanity everywhere. Totally. And I like, do, like I he love... Like he wants to find these small moments of interaction like my between the people My favorite thing about this movie yeah. that I love is that the, move, the show ends. Mm -hmm. It was a great show. Everyone's cheering. Mm -hmm. And then there's 10 minutes of breaking down the sets. Love that. The next day. Love and, that. And there's that kind of casual reveal that Timberlake is there. Yeah. Sipping a coffee... Looking normal. Yeah. And I'm like, he doesn't have to be there for this shortly. He doesn't have to be there for the, like, you know, whatever. They yeah. take the catwalk down or whatever. But I'm, he's just hanging out, too, and it's just kind of like, right, because this is all part of it. I'm going to say something that you might fundamentally disagree with. Okay. Part of me wishes this movie were structured more like The Last Waltz, where rather than it being, like, ten minutes of, you know, or eight minutes or whatever of interviewing the people who are part of the tour— at the beginning and the breakdown at the end, and otherwise it's just show. Mm -hmm. I would like it if in between numbers there were some of those. I, I said I knew I, you were going to disagree. I'm not with angry this. with you. I know you're not angry. With you. I think then so then you I have. Yeah, I do love you very much. Then you have a tour show on your hands, which that's my which taste. is a different thing. It's my taste. Well, that's interesting in yeah. and of itself. But I'm I do not feel faulting like the movie for not doing that. My, obviously, my problem with a tour show is that those things are so cliched, and it's impossible to avoid cliches with e them. Except Never Say Never, which is a really good movie. I've never seen Never Say Never. Never but you, know, but you know what I mean, like you know. But it is a you know yes, the, a, the aesthetics a, of them are sort a of locked film. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I wish, and once again, not holding against this movie that it's not these two other things. I think this movie is about as good as it could possibly be for what it is trying to do. And I, I don't mean that as faint praise. Okay. I think this is objectively an impressively put together show. And Jonathan Demme knows how to shoot musicians better than anyone who's ever done it. He really. totally does. But And there are things that I feel like you don't see in these things where he zooms out and tries to take in the insane visuals. Yes. And not in a way where he's like, drink it in. Yeah. But where he's like, where the light patterns are just kind of dancing across yeah. the camera and it's just sort of like overwhelming. Yes. Like, and I feel like he wants you to just feel overwhelmed. He doesn't want you to feel like awed. Exactly. Yes. But just kind of like, Jesus. Ugh. Yeah. Uh, but, love but that. I was going to say the other thing, and this is just me thinking about a movie that I would prefer to see, not criticizing this movie for not being that, but something like Storefront Hitchcock, which is so creative where it's like, well, rather than just do a Robin Hitchcock concert film, why don't we put Robin Hitchcock in a storefront and have him just play there and anyone who's walking by in the street might happen to see this concert? Sure. Which is such a cool kind of Jonathan Demme idea. That's a great idea. Yes. This film is much closer to the Neil Young documentaries that he's made. It's a concert movie. Which are the same kind of thing where you're just yeah. like, this is a nice guy making a really, really intelligent concert film. Yeah. Of a, a good professional. Seven out of ten. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's good. I, I probably put it as a six, but I take a notch off just for liking Timberlake one point less than you do. That's not them. But I don't even like him that much. I know, and I like him but one I point like less him than you do. Right. right, exactly. I'm it, here's where I am with him. Yeah, he has not made any music of interest to me in many years, and yes. I don't care. Right. But if he did decide to make music that was in of interest to me again, I'd be like, oh, that's nice. I, I am not resistant to giving him praise when I think he has earned it. And I think he has earned it a great number of times. And uh, what goes around comes around. I fucking love and I listen to that all the time. That's probably it's my good favorite moment in the, in performance the in this. Not only because it is my favorite song of his, but I also like that it is a very different interpretation of that song. I like when he did Poison. Yes. The covers are good. What Even the, the other Jacks, covers he well, did? he does Human Nature by Michael Oh, Jackson, right. Of course. Which, of course, when, and when you see that, it's interesting because it's like, you're like, of course, this is his number one musical yes. influence. Right. Both in terms of, how, you know, his age, like, yeah. you know, he grew up with that music. Yes. And just like the way he, but like, it is fascinating to consider all the implications of I that. I know. And it is. He is good. It's a good, you know, it's a good uh, cover. It's a good. It's a know, good cover. Of it. It's yeah. a good cover. But it's also one of those things where you're like, wow, 2016 feels a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. When he goes like, and of course I'm throwing it out to my number mm -hmm. one. And I guess he had just died. No, he hadn't just no, he died. Had, that he was years ago. He died in 2011, 2012. Yeah, yeah. No, he died earlier. He died in 2008. Stop screaming at me. 
Hey, Dad! I think he died in 2008. Nine. 2009. 2009. Okay. Yep. This was in that period where- In that lull post-death period where people were like, well, you know what? Uh, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of pluses and minuses, but in the end of the day, the music, right? Like people were sort of just like, you know what? At the end of the day, the music's good. It is a crazy thing. So you're the one who's now yelling into the microphone. I never yelled in my life. Uh, well, I love you. It's a crazy <laughs> thing that Podcast The Riot has covered extensively, but that like- uh, when the first wave of uh, allegations came out against Michael Jackson, they immediately pulled Michael Jackson out of Disney World, which was the most expensive attraction of all time, Captain EO. Yeah. And then when he died, they were like, oh, it's back. Right. And it was back for seven years. And then they pulled it again. When? After uh, Finding Neverland think, or whatever it's yes. called. Yes. Or when it was called? on the horizon, leaving Neverland. Leaving Neverland. Yeah. Do we want to do our Demi rankings? Yeah. Do we have anything left Let's, to say about no. this movie? My it's, my ranking list is kind of crazy. What? And, crazy? Well, I, look, I have like all these like switched arrows, and I even think I might rethink a couple of these as I'm saying them. You're crazy. You go first. So you want me to go first because yours is crazy? I'll go first. Yeah, okay. I'll do bottom of the top. Okay. I mean, I have 20 movies ranked here. It's the 20 movies we covered. Because it's a lot, it might be fun to go bottom of the top. All right, fine. All right. So at number 20, a master builder. Wh- what? I'm sorry. Correct. <laughs> Come in. Come in. 19, Crazy Mama. Wow. 18, Swing Shift. Now, that's Theatrical. the release cut of the film, Have which you, is what I'm ranking. Okay. I'm I not took a ranking I took the director's I took cut. a different part. I just, as much as I yeah. loved watching it, I have not seen that thing in anything but a fucking, you know, VHS bootleg with a time code. Hey, that's what makes you you and me me. <laughs> Number 17, God, what's it even called? Fighting Mad. <laughs> okay. 16, Citizens Band. Mm-hmm. 15, Last Embrace. Mm-hmm. 14, Caged Heat. 13, Truth About Charlie. Wow. Too high? Too low? Uh, Who can say? Rethink. Who knows? 12, Ricky and The Flash. Mm-hmm. 11, Beloved. Mm-hmm. 10, Justin Timberlake and The mm-hmm. Tennessee Kids. <sighs> Boy. 9, Manchurian Candidate. Okay. This one might make you mad. 8, Melvin and Howard. No, it doesn't make me mad. Okay, fine. Seven, Philadelphia. That makes me furious. <laughs> Six, Married to the Mob. Okay. Now we're getting into like Masterpiece Zone. Yeah. Five, Swimming to Cambodia. Yeah. Four, Something Wild. Three, Rachel Getting Married. Two, Stop Making Sense. Number one, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, I'm rethinking a bunch of these things. Okay, ready? Let me try this. Yeah, go ahead. Number 20. It might surprise you to hear. <laughs> Wait, am I going to have to come in? <laughs> David. <laughs> I invite you to come in because our master filter is coming in. This at poor movie. We just kicked the shit out of it. Never, never heard of Fly. How has that somehow become now the new most bullied film on our show? Okay, number number From, uh, the loveliest man and uh, just lovely people, lovely people. But Jesus Christ, do I never want to watch that thing ever again? Number nineteen, Fighting Mad. Okay, sure. Number eighteen. Ricky and the Flash. Sure. Pretty low. It's, it's, I wasn't ready for Ricky. Yeah. At the end of the day. I like Ricky. She's all right. Number 17, Last Embrace. Okay. Number 16, Justin Timberlake and the Tennessee Kids. Sure. It's not my tempo. Okay, it's not your tempo. And here's the thing you need to understand about the film. It's just not my tempo. <laughs> <laughs> Love it when you repeat a joke and the, the, the add setup to it. No, but I just, I, I'm making a reductive joke about it, but the reality is it's just not my tempo. <laughs> you fucking asshole. God, you, you're lucky that my two o'clock canceled. <laughs> yeah, I am. Right. I was ready to behave so well, and then you told me you, you had a cancellation, and now, baby, I'm wild and woolly. Number 15 would be... Is this right? No. Timberlake was 15, right? No, I think it was 16. Timberlake is 16. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. 15, Truth About Charlie. Get, get, get Crazy Mama in here. What, what's going on? Right. What's 14? I'm at Caged Heat. <laughs> sure. Wait, same, we, we agree on that one. Number 13 is Crazy Mama. Okay, fine. I mean, That's my favorite of the early ones. I just, that movie made no sense to me. <laughs> I got it. Dare I say it? Yeah. It was kind of my tempo. <sighs> It was. Ooh. I went ring a ding ding. That's my tempo. Okay. Number twelve, beloved. Uh huh. Sure. Number eleven, citizens band. 
Sure. You like that one more than me. When it works, it really I, works. I agree with that. I, I might also give it another shot someday. It's got some magic in it. And we watched it in a period where we were watching like five movies. We were, in we were watching them fast. Days. I mean, I'm yeah. not like you. I try to schedule ahead of time, but yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> Uh, but Crazy Mom and Susan's band for me are sloppy, but they have these real moments up here. I don't made. dislike any of these movies except maybe a masterpiece. That's the only one. <laughs> and just to be clear, I would give a master builder an atomic legend if I could. <laughs> but this is overall just standard I, level I, of quality. Like the, the basement is like a six out of ten or whatever. And for right? how yeah, many like films a- it is. Like, for being the, our longest miniseries, right, it's right. also weirdly maybe the most consistent. Yes, 100%. Um, yes. Or at least the highest uh, no, median they, Yeah, because I even like, like, The Truth About Charlie, which right. is, like, the bomb. Right, right. Yeah. right. right. Anyway. Number 10, Manchurian and Candid. Okay. Number 9, Swim to Cambodia. Ooh, that's too low. Well, you know what? I did a little switchy here. All right, fine. Go so on. I got to acknowledge the switch. Number 9, Married to the Mob. Number 8, Swim to Cambodia. Okay. Yeah. Then I do number 7... Swing shift director's cut. Okay. I mean, you know. That's me. That's you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Tem- it's a tempo thing. Philadelphia number six. Yeah. And now we get in a masterpiece territory. I think they're pretty much five inarguable masterpieces this guy's made. Just five Hall of Famers outside. Right. Because for you, Melvin is at that level. For right. me, it's a little below. So I go something wild, number five. Mm-hmm. Melvin Howard, number four. So we have the same top three. Yeah. Rachel getting married, number three. Sansa Lambs, number two. And so this, you have stuff. It's a squeaker. I mean, it's like, it's, fair. it's I, kind of a I'm coin toss. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you. And it literally just gets down to the fact that there is not one single thing I could criticize and stop making sense. Yeah. You know? These yeah. are both two of the best films ever made by anybody in history. So the only advantage I'm giving to stop making sense is that you you just, you can't, what, what can you criticize in that thing? Um, it couldn't be better. Not long enough. Yeah. Oh fuck. Maybe I have to move Knock lower it down. down my Make list. it number uh, nineteen. That's my list. Now I want to say a little something here. Oh. Okay. And not to betray anyone's trust. Okay. But uh, this is in a way that has not happened in the past. Doing the show, and I think part of this is show has been going on for a long time. We've we've gained listenership. Our audience has grown. The larger number of people who listen to it means the larger number of people who have crossed paths with the people that we've talked about. Right. I have no idea what you're about to say. Just say it. We have gotten a good number of messages, private people messages. people who, who knew emails, Jonathan Demme. DMs, people showing up on That's the Reddit, yeah. people who knew him well, people who worked with him, people who knew him socially, people who worked one day, or my little brother was an extra people on this People who knew movie. him in a hat, people who knew him, I'm sorry, I was trying to do a Dr. Seuss. In a boat and in a moat, right? <laughs> But, but people who really knew him at different times in his life, yes, different levels. Absolutely. And uh, that's nerve-wracking. Sure. It is very nerve-wracking because we do this show, and sometimes we can be big, stupid dummies, you know? Yes. And when you think about— I don't think anyone should listen. I Agreed. And I actually want to ban the show, and Rich, that's my next we initiative. we talk about not, not yeah. publishing the episodes? Yeah. yeah. Just re- we want to self-cancel, Morgan Spurlock style. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, no, don't even bring him up. Anyway, you're saying something nice about Jonathan Demme. I'm saying something nice about Jonathan Demme, which is, uh, especially when this is the first filmmaker we have covered who is no longer with us, and it's the first time we, you know, are are carrying some microscopic semblance of responsibility for the legacy by committing this much time I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. Every time one of these messages popped up, I would get a little bit nervous. And go, oh my God, this person's listening to the And they'd be like, and, excuse me, his favorite movie was A Master Builder. Right. And you guys need to check yourselves. Right, and I go, mea culpa, mea culpa. This is the thing, actually, that episode hasn't aired yet, and all the people who've been so nice are going to turn on us when that comes out. Yeah, maybe we won't need to self dance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unfair bullying, oh, punching boy. down on Master Builder. Get out! <laughs> Sorry. I think we made this joke in this episode, but there will probably be more people who listen to that episode than have ever seen a Master Belt there, right? And that's not a brag about our numbers. At all. Absolutely not. (laughs) But the thing I was going to say is the amount of people who have reached out to us, compelled to say, look, I I wouldn't usually write in, I don't know you, but I, blank, blank, Jonathan Demme, knew him here, worked with him there, had this, had that. Yes, yes. Knew him on a boat, knew him on a boat. And have said he really was that special. Right. I, I, I'm really, like, touched that it's you guys— not, It's not, like, fake or inflated or whatever. His whole rep is, like, a genuinely great the, guy. The overall sentiment always seems to be, I want you guys to know that he is the person you want to believe he was. Right. 
You know, as much as we come up with bits, and I I feel like we kind of any filmmaker we cover, we make bits. We've I'm sorry. Let me check my notes here. Oh no, uh, no bits. Let me underline that. No bits. But as much as we sometimes uh, turn our uh, director that we're covering into like a character, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, I feel like our bit with Demi has just been like, this guy is so kind. Yeah, He's and, a sweet man. Right. And everyone's like, you're not being reductive. You're not simplifying the thing. This guy was as intellectually curious and empathetic and considerate and collaborative and everything you're sort of talking about. Um, And it's been really nice that uh, uh, you guys have been giving him this much time and consideration across these many, many months and all of these films. Many months. And I feel similarly so thankful that uh, he won this March Madness competition. What a great That we were surprise. forced to do him because yep. I feel like we would have always felt a little skittish about, eh, it's a lot of films and not all of them are super well known. Yeah, we do it's a it? lot of films. It's a lot of films. And we almost didn't even put them on the bracket because we went 20s a lot. We actually, I remember, had the debate where I, you were like, what would we even do? And I'd be like, you'd have to combine, right. but then you can do it. Yeah. But I think he was the last yes. one we slotted in. 100%. And I feel so I keep grateful. Saying 100%. I know that I say that. We've all done time. this. I, I feel like it has been such a joy. It has genuinely improved my mood, my mental stability, my outlook on the world. Um, and it makes me really happy when I see uh, on Twitter a lot more discussion stirring up or Letterbox or wherever about Demi films. And I'm not giving us responsibility for that, but it's a nice thing that like we can talk about these movies, our listeners can get into them, and then our listeners posting about watching those movies encourages other people to watch those movies because we're just sort of doing our little part to start the ball rolling and re-entering a lot of these things back into the conversation. To the extent that people's algorithm algorithms are now messed up. Yeah. And like, you know, their TVs are telling them to watch the truth about Charlie. Right. Uh, and look, apologies for that. But yes. also, <laughs> Truth About Charlie is one of the best bad movies you're ever going to see. Oh, it's great. You know? And it's... Uh, Jonathan Demi movies do kind of make the world a better place. Yes, they do. I think they kind of make us better people. Yeah. And he was a dude who felt a lot of responsibility to make sure that what he put in the movies was positive, that he was putting positive things out into the world, while also being honest, you know, and being tough. But uh, I, I think he succeeded. Mm-hmm. And I also just feel like by the nature of what this show is and it being people who have gotten to this sort of quote-unquote auteur level, Mm-hmm. Very often, a lot of the people we cover on the show do not have reputations for being particularly nice. Right. And we have never covered someone who we think to be a monster. But there are a lot of people where it's like, ooh, he's and tough. They're, they're difficult personalities. They're strong personalities. They're uh, yes. mean, maybe. And in the five years that we've been doing this show, at times, I feel a slight amount of uncomfort, discomfort, in like, are we starting to like deify people who are like exacting artists to the point of being belligerent assholes sure because that's the narrative and it's a self-perpetuating narrative that then makes people feel like if you're in a the only way to get ahead in this business to be mean and also to tolerate meanness and to allow people to behave but but that's not what we're we're not talking what i'm saying is it has been so lovely to cover someone who didn't do any of that who was always leading with his humanity first both on screen and off screen you know in terms of the work and in terms of how he conducted his life and to have that many people who knew him reach out and, and reassert that yes, to us. it's great. And but it feels really good to say, you can do it. You can be I know. a fucking you're saying mensch right. and you can make great movies and you can make big hits and you can win Oscars That's and true. there's no excuse to be an asshole. But the, it is interesting that we mostly spent this last episode talking about Justin Timberlake. <laughs> Because I don't know. I mean, whatever. It's a Justin Timberlake episode. Where we're like, what was he thinking in, in time? Yeah, because I knew I was going to do this spiel I'm at joking, the end. I'm Let's talk about the Timberlake career. I'm just, I'm just, you got too sincere, so I want it to be funny. It makes you so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel so delighted to have done him um, because I hadn't seen all these movies. Yeah. And I hadn't, I, I don't know. It's always, it's always so great. I will eventually work my way through the remaining documentaries. Me too. But it is an incredible feeling uh, to... To be able to say, I have seen the entire Jonathan Demme uh, narrative filmography, and I think I am a better person for it. Hell yeah. And you can be too. Yeah, and According you can be to too. The I'm actually Learn better who, right habits. Now. Either sign up for Noom or watch have all Have we the announced Jonathan who Demi we're film. doing next? Yeah, but let's say it again. George Miller. George Miller. Yeah. Mad Pod Fury Cast. Yeah. 
We're doing them, baby. We're, yeah, we're doing them. We're not doing Jackson. We're not doing May. We threw all your mother effers off our scent. And March Madness. March Madness is uh, is is happening right oh, now. Oh, boy. Is, 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 we're in the middle of it right now. Yes. And, of course, as we know... Has just been no, no, steamrolling. Enough, enough. We don't need to do. We don't need to do that. You're right. This is mean. I'm not going to yeah. make Rachel do more. Work. Yeah, exactly. As right. we know, someone is winning. Uh, yeah. So, so George Miller coming up. We've done a lot of those already. That's a uh, very different from yeah. this. Very different. Fast. Yes. <laughs> sure. Much like Sonic, George Miller has got to go fast. Um, but it's been good, right? I think they've been good episodes. Yeah. I like talking about Mad Max. It's a big. Big radical swing into a different world in a different direction. And then we have someone else coming up after that, and then we'll do March Madness, and then we'll do someone else. I'll say this too. Three directors in a row have a reputation for being very nice. That's true. That's true. You know, three different Georgie, filmographies, but yeah. I feel like all three of these people in a row are kind of known for being humane Right, mentions. so you guys should like pick Michael Bay to balance it out or whatever. Yeah, we should cover an <laughs> asshole again. <laughs> all right, come on, we're done. Enough. Okay. Pasta. Pasta? Yeah, it's Italian. You know the enough. only other person who says that to me when I'm talking too much? My mother. You know, my mother says it to me, too. That's where I got it from. Oh, boy. Our mother should hang out. Yeah, they should. Do a podcast. Yeah, great. Thank you all for listening. Blank check moms. Oh, blank check mommies. My mom. No, not mommies. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's blank beat check up. mama. <laughs> my mom is putting the, the heat on me for the fact that it's like, huh, it's, and, and every other film, uh, family member's been on the show. Does she want to come on? Yes, she wants to come. Really? On. Yeah. Oh, then she should come on. She's also the only member of my family who listens to the show, which terrifies me. She listens to every episode? Pretty much now, which kind of snuck up on me. That was not the case for a oh, while. And I know her the least of all your family. I feel like I've only met her like one time. The quiet Newman. <laughs> the secret Newman. Yeah. No, you also know her the least because she has uh, never been on this podcast. Right. Exactly. Uh, so look forward to my mother being the guest on some episode future day. Thank you all for listening. Yes. Maybe my mom won't listen to this one because it's a Thursday bonus. Yeah. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Ange for Gouda, for her social media, Lane Montgomery for our theme song, Joe Bone, Pat Rounds for our artwork. Thanks to producer Rachel Jacobs for our editing. Tune in next week for fifth anniversary. Uh, yeah. Tough to make the five, but we've done it. Yeah, tune, tune in Sunday for that. We got a very special fifth anniversary episode coming up. This Sunday. Yes. Go to blankies.red.com for some real nerdy shit. And as always, Master Builder is that kid who eats its own books. <laughs> <laughs>